tonight, let's open our memorial to Ara Emmett Kennedy the same way he opened his most successful recital on March 4th, 1925, in New York Town Hall. Today, we buy most of our food and other household needs at supermarkets and shopping malls. But at the turn of the century, a quaint old custom was going about of the Negro street vendor with their plaintive, melodious cries by which they announced their wares. But this was probably more prevalent in the French quarters of New Orleans. But Gretna also had its share of street vendors. A time on a custom was the weekly washing done in the backyards and a common sight in Gretna on Mondays was the clothes pole man plying his trade with a bundle of long clothes poles on his shoulders. Hear his street cry. This is blackberry harvesting time, and some of you may recall the blackberry woman who came to town with her belated spring song and a basket of berries on her head, with the dew of the berries dew dripping down her back in purple streams. The basket is covered with sprays of elder and sycamore leaves to protect the berries from the heat of the sun. Her cry as she walked through the streets of old Gretna had suggested an air of melancholy. Hear it. Blackberries, fresh and fine. I got blackberries, lady, fresh from the vine. I got blackberries, green for dine, blackberries, I got blackberries. Before air conditioning, before air conditioning, it could be very soothing to your mental condition on a hot August night to hear the song of the potato cake lady. The cakes were made of sweet potatoes, though occasionally they were made of Irish potatoes, and they were sold hot. The cry was always given in jumbo French, the patois spoken by Creole Negroes. Another street vendor in the early 1900s was the charcoal man. He had no special season, but would usually come around twice a week as charcoal was in constant demand by the washerwoman. In Gretna, one of the charcoal vendors used to go around with an old white mule and a rickety spring wagon with his own street choir. Hear the street choir of the charcoal man. My mule is white, my charcoal is black. I sell my charcoal to bits of sack. Charcoal, charcoal. In the autumn, the chimney sweeper came around to remind people that their chimneys needed cleaning before the coming of winter. He was dressed in the traditional chimney sweeper's attire with a top hat, a long linen duster, and a bundle of sacks and ropes and long bushes made from long sprayed leaves of the palmetto draped over his shoulder. He called himself Rumala, which is in gumbo French, the word Rumale, meaning chimney sweeper. Rumana, 
Rumana, Rumana lady, I know why your chimney won't draw, so won't bake and make your cake. I know why your chimney won't draw. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to present to you our mayor, the Honorable Ronnie Harris. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on May 19, 1913, Governor Luther E. Hall signed a proclamation declaring this to be the village of Gretna. Today is our Founders Day. It took many, many people and much political will to declare this community an incorporated village and in August a incorporated city. Tonight, we are going to look back 82 years ago at a culture and a community. That culture and community was captured by one individual who had very, very great talents. That person is Robert Emmett Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy was a most amazing person. Born in 1877, Emmett Kennedy grew up in a household full of music. His father was an, uh, from Ireland as well as his mother. His father played the violin. The mother was a sweet song maker around the house. So there was music and joy in his entire household. Kennedy grew up on 8th Street near Amelia, and that was the back of town. On his back porch, he heard some wonderful sounds coming through the air. Those sounds were the spirituals coming from the New Hope Baptist Church. He was so invigorated by these spirituals, it just set him off on a course that would take his career from Gretna to New Orleans to New York. He published five books about the African-American spirituals and dialect prose. What Robert Emmett Kennedy did was a great favor to us today. Imagine, if you will, with technology in photography, in videos, in computer imagery. Imagine, if you will, your mind, a person who thinks of life in a videotape, yet with age, that videotape will tend to blur, scenes forgotten, colors fade. What Emmett Kennedy did for us was take a snapshot of the community in East Green of Gretna. His music, his prose, in his books, painted a picture of a culture, in his words, was simple, pure, and natural. Robert Emmett Kennedy was our photograph of the turn of the century, 1900s to the 1920s, to study a culture that was, number one, uneducated, number two, highly segregated. And this particular atmosphere, environment, made their culture pure. And that's what his books and songs are all about. His talents was the vehicle that took the picture of the community and transforms it to today. His talents of a man is, are the images that we are honoring this evening. But exactly what did he do with these talents? These talents enable us to know in the evolution of the musical heritage of the black spiritual into gospel music of today. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening, physically through the help of the Jefferson Parish Library System and spiritually through the New Hope Baptist Church Choir, we are going to bring Robert Emmett Kennedy home, home again to Gretna. Emmett Kennedy began 
writing verse when he was 15 years old. Some of it was published in the old New Orleans City News and some in the Southern Magazine. Much of his early verse shows the influence of his Irish ancestry, but as a youth he was drawn to the African-American spiritual he heard coming from the New Hope Baptist Church, which was right next to his backyard. His first publication, published work in 1910 were two books of poetry, one in Celtic Irish and the other in the most unique poetic Louisiana Negro dialect, remnant of North Ham, a private painting of 250 copies and with photographs taken by Emmett Kennedy himself. These two books did not attract much attention, but after the later publication in New York of two books, both with spiritual and music, and both of the Louisiana Negro dialect in the prose and in spirituals, Kennedy received the much acclaim and his books thenceforth caught the attention of the nation. In the middle of his career, Kennedy wrote another book of Celtic Irish poems, followed by three more books of African American songs, music and dialect folk stories. He ended his career with another book of poetry concerned with the mythology of pagan Irish. Let's first review Kennedy's three short books of Irish poetry. In Songs of Ingus, Kennedy took up the pen of Ingus of Celtic Irish mythology, singing the songs of an old rustic harper, giving thanks to the glory for the glory of the song. Uh, this book was published in 1910 by a New Orleans print shop. In Rooms and Cadences, the poems were written by Kennedy in the role of a serious Celtic bard, bringing to the reader his ancestral memories uh, of the old he heroic days. The very Reverend John J. Jeffers of St. Joseph's College in Mountain View, California, said on January 8th, Not for a long time has any volume so sweet, so wholesome, or so refreshing been issued as Runes and Cadences by R. Emmett Kennedy. Songs of an Alien Spirit was published in New York in 1940. It is a small book of poems of personified remembrances as Kennedy's wandering mind roamed through the mythology of the pagan Irish and the legends of the high kings of Ireland. Kennedy published Black Cameo in 1924. This was the book which brought him to the attention of book reviewers throughout the United States. It is a book of short stories woven around the spiritual song in the Black Baptist churches in the musical East Green of Brittany. Mr. Kennedy strikes the keynote of this fascinating collection of stories and spirituals in the opening sentences of his introduction when he says, in attempting these verbal transcriptions of Negro life in Southern Louisiana, it is my desire to give true portrayals of the people as they really are. He has succeeded to a most noteworthy degree. His stories are the very quintessence of the colored people with whom he has grown up with, whom he loves. They are uproariously amusing without departing from the truth. The sketches of the singers and their neighbors reflect their deep concern about the saving of their individual souls and the souls of all their friends and relatives. The spirituals incorporated in the sketches are given in simple form. Just as Kennedy took them down from the singing of the Negroes, he heard many times in the churches or at wakes or at watch meetings. Herschel Perkel, The New York Post, 1924.
Blues, a chronicle of unbroken singers, was published in 1925 and proved to be Kennedy's most popular and enduring book and firmly established him as one of the leading folklorists in the United States. Within the covers of Mellows, music, comment, and illustrations combine in a seductive triad. From a, single, from a small area in Louisiana, Mr. Kennedy has gathered street cries, folk songs, work songs, and spirituals, or Mellows. Mellows is a book which lingers hauntingly in the mind with the echo and insistence of an easily learned folk tune. Janet Ramsey, New York World, January 10th, 1926. The most engaging volume, both in regard to appearance and content, that has come to the corner table this year is Mellows by R. Emmett Kennedy from the corner table, New York, 1925. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our West Jefferson High School teacher from the New Hope Baptist Church, who has been most instrumental in arranging for the singing and music portion of our program. I present to you Mr. Stanley Crosby. To the narrator, Mayor Harris, officers and members of the Gretna Historic Society, platform guests, and the general audience. Gretna natives ought to be proud of this revelation about their history, which was recorded by the sole historian of the people of the East Green, R. Emmett Kennedy. Suppose Kennedy had not been interested in what was happening in the black community. Those slices of our history and the lives of our great-grandparents would be lost from us forever. Kennedy's greatest love was the spirituals sung by the African Americans in the black churches in Gretna, particularly the New Hope Baptist Church, which adjoined the backyard of his home on 8th Street. He wrote down words, set some of these songs to music, thus creating a record of the spirituals as sung in the East Green and preserving them. Certainly, this is a priceless heritage for our African ancestors for future generations. His texts give a vivid, honest picture of the life and folkways of those singers who gave natural expression of their faith and melodic form. We are fortunate to have present with us tonight some of the posterity of several of those ancestors mentioned in Kennedy's book. Such names mentioned were the Selicos, Elvana Stewart, Ned Winesbury, Joseph Francois, Beth Ellison, Hattie Sparks, Viney Mitchell, the Stewart family, and Reverend Putney Ward. In fact, one of the oldest living citizens of Gretna, Reverend Percy Thomas, who is soon to turn 94 years old, is also present in our audience tonight. We are also fortunate to have as a speaker tonight another historian who, like Kennedy, has kept records of just about everything that has happened at the New Hope Baptist Church to add to the records of her great-grandfather, James Sparks, who served as secretary for over 30 years at the, United, at the New Hope Baptist Church. During those days, he was one of the few blacks who could read and write. Our speaker tonight is a native of Gretna, and it's privileged to have original copies of several of Kennedy's books, which he sent to her grandmother, Julie Sparks, who served as a maid in the Kennedy household. In fact, the property where she presently resides on 8th Street, adjacent to the New Hope Baptist Church, was purchased from the Kennedys by her ancestors. I am happy to present to some of you and to introduce to others 
our New Hope Baptist Church historian, Mrs. Leola Ambrose Crosby, who, in her own words, will speak about our honoree and this occasion, Mrs. Crosby. Honorable Mayor Harris, officers and members of the Gretna Historical Society, and all honored and distinguished guests, and to this assembly, I'm honored to be included in this event. It's first like finding a buried treasure and everyone is elated. The Bible quotes, there is nothing hidden, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed neither hid that shall not be known. I'm elated tonight, and as many other blacks are elated, because the discovery of one of Gretna's own, Emmett Kennedy, preserved our culture, the black Negro culture of Gretna. The people, he preserved something that we could not have preserved. He did something that we was not able to do. He preserved our lifestyle of places, people, and things. Because of his relationship to my great-grandmother, Julia Spock, her two sons, and other members of our family. Books, Red Bean Row, Black Cameo, and Britney Folk was sent to her after every publication. And our family used those books for entertainment. And then when others needed entertainment, we loaned those books out for that reason. And that was how the books that we had was lost in that process. I would like to say this, I can't remember, I do not know if any other black family on the West Bank had I received Emmett Kennedy's book. The blacks was not able to buy them, and very few white ones bought them. So tonight, I began in 1987 to look for those books, because those books brought back memories of my people, my family, and people that I knew. Stanley Crosby told you of a lot of the names that were mentioned in these books. Tonight, a lot of the descendants of these people are here tonight to give honor to Emmett Kennedy.
Whitney People was published by Kennedy in 1927. It is a book of short stories centered around the lives of the African Americans in Gretna. They were called Gritney. This is a collection of 33 stories written in the manner of the Canterbury Tales concerning the company of sundry people. They all gather at the cook shop of an old Negro woman to eat and laugh, talk and sing, as the night of July 4th offers an excuse for Aunt Susan to have a big enterprise, as such an occasion is called in Gretna, Louisiana. While the specialties of the shop, gumbo, black-eyed peas, sweet potato pie are consumed, the customers tell each other stories, gossip about their neighbors, both black and white, and philosophize about life itself. Their conversations fall into place as tales reveal the lives and loves superstitions and religious views of the town's dark population, for whom as a rule, nature's ways are God's ways. Julia Peterkin, Saturday Review of Literature, New York, February 2nd, 1928. Now, we go to Red Bean Row, a row of shotgun cottages, each with a gallery, a room, a kitchen, and privy in the backyard, all painted in maroonish red. Red Bean Row, around 1900, was located back of town on what is now 9th Street between Lafayette and Newton Street. Only occasionally now is there a Negro story of the old-fashioned kind, but the characters natural, the dialect true, and the atmosphere and action convincing. Red Bean Row by R. Emmett Kennedy is such a story, though in treatment it is in the modern mode. Obviously, Mr. Kennedy knows intimately the details of Southern Negro life. The action of this tale takes place in the Negro quarter of a Louisiana parish a short distance from New Orleans. Their impulses, passions, habits, superstitions and simple philosophy are revealed with clear-cut realism. It has both comedy and tragedy. And there is a strain of romance which is weirdly interesting. The Independent, St. Petersburg, Florida, October 19, 1929. The picturesque life and language of the small Negro quarters in a Louisiana town is recorded with vivid and startling accuracy by Mr. Kennedy in Red Bean Row. It is filled with comic bits and with deadly tragedy, which together make the story teem with real life and color. The story is told in Negro dialect with all of the pleasing vagaries. The lore of this language and pictures which are constantly being drawn fascinate the reader. The Progress, Portland, Maine, October 28, 1929. In Moore Mellows, Emmett Kennedy brought us another collection of sacred and secular songs of African Americans, including some original compositions by Kennedy. Again, he weaves tales of the singers around the spirituals and extends his field from and including Gretna, New Iberia, Patterson, and Baton Rouge. Mr. Kennedy has again provided us with a delightful collection of Negro spirituals. He is the most original of the many commentators on the subject. His songs are intensely native, and they are the cries of the Negro soul. And this collection, more than any other that I have seen, has less of a didactic thumpery and more of a genuine caliber. The Times Union, Jacksonville, Florida, May 31st, 1931. Mr. Kennedy here follows his earlier collection of Negro spirituals with another batch of ballets without music, harmonized and unharmonized spirituals, and harmonized folk songs. Mr. Kennedy's interpretive running commentary on the melodies, sympathetic, revealing, and erudite, adding immensely to the interest of the songs themselves. The importance of Mr. Kennedy's work in bringing this music to the notice of the general public can scarcely be overestimated. The Quran, Hartford, Connecticut, May 17, 1931. 
You have noticed the beautiful, interesting panels prepared by the AMSAD Research Center. The AMSAD Research Center, with over 10 million documents, 250,000 photographs, and the finest African-American art collection in the Deep South, is one of the nation's premier minority repositories and the first archive dedicated to African-American and the Civil Rights Movement. The center is open to the public and located at Tulane University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. James Wilson, archivist at the Amstead Research Center. the Amstead Research Center. I'm delighted to be here and to be associated with this worthwhile project. The history of Afri African Americans is often very difficult to reconstruct and knowledge of the West Bank is even more limited. Fortunately, we have a remarkable ledger from the pen of R. Emmett Kennedy. As Kennedy understood, the Negro spiritual was a musical and cultural triumph in the face of seemingly overwhelming opposition. Spirituals originated from the depths of slavery as an incorporation of African rhythms and religious camp songs. In singing of a deliverance which they believed would surely come with enthusiasm born of a common experience and of common hope, slaves were able to lose sight for the moment of the wilderness of slavery and bondage in which they lived. Slaves often used the songs to give dangerous meanings to white hymns. For example, the year of Jubilee meant the end of slavery, and follow the drinking gourd referred, referred to fleeing towards the North Star. Runaway slave leader Harriet Tubman even led many slaves to freedom via the Underground Railroad by using spirituals as code messages. 
public may have lost these genuinely unique songs and their creative force if it were not for the popularization of Negro spirituals around the world after the Civil War by groups like the Hampton Institute's Choir and the famed Jubilee Singers of Fisk University. At the same time, whites appropriated a portion of this legacy to launch the American popular stage, including the crude and often derogatory parodies of the minstrel shows. In R. Emmett Kennedy's time, the Negro spiritual was a controversial issue. Many authorities not willing to give African Americans credit for anything proclaimed spirituals as only borrowing from white songs and nothing truly original. Kennedy not only saw the African American contribution, but noted the strong African roots to the spirit of the music. As Booker T. Washington once wrote, the music, the music of these songs goes to the heart because it comes from the heart. R. Emmett Kennedy's views were for their time were very enlightened. He defended a culture that most white Americans ridiculed and dehumanized. It is also important to remember that Kennedy was only a recorder and give due honor and recognition to the singers at the New Hope Baptist Church about which Kennedy was writing. This is why I'm proud to present to the people of Gretna, Mayor Harris and the Gretna Historical Society the exhibit in the back on Kennedy and his works may continue to remind people of Kennedy and his unique contributions and of the people that inspired him. The Amstead Research Center is located at Tulane University and open to the public. And I would encourage everyone to come by and use our vast resources related to Negro spirituals and the contributions of African Americans to all aspects of American society. Thank you so much. Folks, now listen to a song, sung as it was sung in the 1920s, a solo by Mr. Herman Adams, a member of the New Hope Baptist Church. What did I 
me now introduce the two people who will make presentations. First, Ms. Elizabeth Swartz, president of the Gretna Historical Society. Reverend Piper, on behalf of the Gretna Historical Society, I'm delighted to present a painting of the original New Hope Baptist Church. The painting was made from sketches drawn from memory by Leola Crosby and others. Since there was no photograph available, since the first church was destroyed by the hurricane of 1915, Reverend Piper, we ask that you accept this painting for the New Hope Baptist Church, the source and inspiration for much of Robert M. Emmett Kennedy's works, and also request that it be accepted in honor of Leola Ambrose Crosby, the one person who has kept the memory of R. Emmett Kennedy alive all these years in the East Green of Old Brittany. <laughs> On the behalf of the officers and members of the New Hope Baptist Church, I indeed with great honor and great pride accept this photograph, or this painting rather, of the New Hope Baptist Church in its original state. But you will be surprised how close that still re resembles the present structure. Thank you so much, and it will be held in great esteem. I'm Dave Woodburn, director of the Jefferson Parish Library Department. Um, I have a very special dedication to make this evening and to preside over, uh, one that will make sure that our Emmett Kennedy's works will have a permanent home here in Gretna and in the Gretna Public Library. First though, I'd like two people uh, to share in this dedication with me. The first is already down here and that is Mrs. Leola Crosby from the New Hope Baptist Church. The second is Mr. J.B. Burrell, who is a member of the Gretna Historical Association and editor of their newsletter. And Mr. Burrell has done a great deal of research for this program. Mrs. Crosby, Mr. Burrell, would you join me up here, please? Are you with me? Okay. Ms. Crosby, would you come over here? <laughs> Would you join me in the dedication of this special uh, bookcase which will preserve the works of uh, Mr. Kennedy for the community? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. last book, published in 1940, one year before his death in New Orleans on November 21st, 1941, contains this poem, Crenodia. When the story of is complete and there's no more to tell, and my soul makes retreat to its heaven or hell when no longer the street hears my funeral bell and the gossip you meet have dissected me well when my friends have revealed all my life's rectitude then I pray caught me down to the back of town and lay me away in my ancestral mound. And leave me, I say, without murmur or sound, 
that unwelcome would say mid the stillness around. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the evening. The city of Bretton is very, very proud to put this program on. And on behalf of all the elected officials, obviously, we want to recognize a lot of people tonight. And to begin with, I would like to introduce to you those elected officials. Alderman at large, Bunny Yuse. Alderman from District 2, Sammy Marchese. Alderman of District 3, Vincent Cox. We're indebted to the Jefferson Parish Library System, Mr. David Woodburn, the director. Oops, I missed that. And on behalf of the Amstead Research Center, James Wilson, archivist, and of course his director is Dr. Fred Stilo, who is a uh, was most instrumental in helping us do this. The Gretna Historical Society President Elizabeth Schwartz. And of course, the two people that really made this possible Mr. Stanley Crossy and Mrs. Leola Crosby. some voices tonight that I would like to introduce. The Master of Ceremonies and narrator, the Reverend Dr. Arthur Piper. Reverend, come on out. No, there he is. We had a male critic voice tonight, Mr. Rudy DeSalles. And that female critic, and I know her well, my wife, Donna Harris. Our male 
street choir, who was the charcoal man, the clothes pole salesman, and our soloist, Mr. Herman Adams. <laughs> and the strong, beautiful sounds of the New Hope Baptist Church Choir. Stand up. This program would not have happened without a dedication of a single person that spent hours of research and invigorated my love for Robert Emmett Kennedy through an October 1993 Gretna Historical Society newsletter, its editor, Mr. J.B. Burrell. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and good night. Thank you.